Lakshmi Tantra, Chapter 17 The Secret Method of Self-Surrender Chakra I salute thee who residest in the lotus, mother of all embodied beings, and wife of Padmanabha. I salute thee again, O lotus goddess. Thou hast already revealed to me the three methods, and I have understood them. O lotus goddess, my mother, please inform me of the supreme fourth method. Shri Narayana is the one eternal god, Vasudeva, the absolute Brahman, the flawless fourfold god, consisting of existence, consciousness, and bliss. I am his absolute and unique Shakti, the eternal goddess, performing all his functions and sharing all his states of existence. Brahman is tranquil, ever conscious and full of bliss, absolute and constant, the repository of supreme divine majesty and entirely quiescent. I am Brahman's Shakti, Brahmi, consisting of tranquility, bliss and consciousness, characterized by supreme divine majesty, free from impurity and entirely quiescent. When to reassure living beings Narayana, the absolute Brahman, assumes a majestic form of corporeal existence, which is divine and pleasing to the eye, then I too possess a corporeal form. I am Narayana's supreme Shakti, perfect, with well-proportioned limbs, and beautiful in every limb. Our supreme abode, untouched by sorrow, is the great space. The whole group of the divine attributes has voluntarily chosen to be limited by space. That abode is attained by siddhas, successful adepts, who have proved themselves unfailingly devout in the performance of their duties, are thorough masters of the Vedas and of the Upanishads, and have purged themselves of all defilement through innumerable cycles of rebirth, who have attained success through enduring great suffering, who have gradually removed all impediments, are versed in reasoning and observance of the precepts, who have attained realization and mastered the philosophy of the principles, Sankhya, who have control over all their senses, who possess both dharana and dhyana, who are yogins and have attained samadhi. That abode can only be attained after a hundred years of ceaseless devotion to God by those who are wise and aware of the duties to be performed during the five divisions of the day, and skilled in performing the five types of sacrifices. That ancient space is highest of all and eternal. Arriving there, those who are familiar with the principles sever all their fetters. Those who have thrown off the shackles of transient existence abide there in splendor, like tens of millions of suns and millions of full moons. They are free from all sensual defects and are surrounded with brilliance. They exude nothing and partake of no food. Their bodies are composed of the six attributes and are pure. That is where, after exhausting the consequences of their deeds extending over a very long period, the highly privileged Encantins enjoy the constant sight of us. There, the Brahmas and Shankaras, along with Purandaras, the gods and the ever-successful sages who are ever omniscient, 
rejoice and directly view the supreme form of Vishnu. There, too, abide those perfect adepts who meditate on the mantras of six, eight, twelve, or sixteen letters, or else on the pranava mantra, Aung, the mantra starting with Jitangte, etc., or on the Tarka or Anuttara mantras. In that place, there is overall rejoicing amongst the pure divine beings, including Anantashesha, Garuda, the king of birds, Vishvaksena, etc., and all those deities who execute my commands. That is where the divine possessor of Sri, the god of gods, Janardana, reclines on the resplendent and highly blissful couch of Ananta's coils. He is richly adorned with weapons, as well as with divine and wonderful ornaments consisting of Vijnana, Aishwarya, Virya, and an abundance of Shakti, Tejas, and Bala. He is served by the king of birds, Suparna, Garuda, representing the Panchopanishad mantras, and formally attended by the glorious commander Vishvaksena, who resembles Narayana in form and bears the characteristic mark of Srivatsa. To bring well-being to all the worlds, to facilitate contemplation by the wise, to liberate all those in bondage, and to furnish a form for the yogis to meditate on, Vasudeva, Narayana, the possessor of Sri, the eternal God, assumes a body that is delicate, young, divine, marked with Srivatsa, four-armed, lotus-eyed, wearing a crown and the Kaustaba jewel, splendidly adorned with necklaces, anklets, armlets, girdles, clothed in a yellow garment, bearing the supreme divine Vanamala, consisting of the five active shaktis of Sri, perfectly formed and beautiful in every limb. He is the supreme king of the entire universe, the highest lord of creation. I, the consort of this beloved god Vishnu, possessing all virtues, am the supreme and eternal goddess whose nature is knowledge and bliss. I am perfect and perfectly formed and always endowed with his divine traits. I, lotus-eyed and lotus-garlanded, Supreme Mistress of all beings, am ever served by the Supreme Eternal Shaktis, Srishti, Stiti, etc. I am covered with 32,000 creative Shaktis and surrounded by twice that number of divine sustaining Shaktis, and I am filled with twice that number of destructive Shaktis. I am the chief of all Shaktis, and supreme controller of the whole world. I, the queen consort of the omnipresent God of gods, am the bestower of everything that is desired. In beauty, virtue, and age, I equal Hari, whose mind I captivate. In those particular states relevant to Lord Sharngin's, Vishnu's, particular requirements, I, ever endowed with all his attributes, execute his functions. I rest on the knees of Vishnu, the god of guards, Shangin, and very much loved by him. I have attained absolute identity of essence with him. Once, on beholding the tormented living beings in the belly of blazing samsara, transient existence, Pity spontaneously arose in me, who am omniscient, and I started pondering how they might overcome their misery and attain happiness, and how, after crossing the samsara, they might come to me who await them on the further shore.
Thus, overwhelmed with compassion, I pleaded with the God of gods. Adorable one, Lord, God of the gods, Master of the world and my beloved, O Achyutta, thou who art the beginning, middle, and end of all, the ultimate above all, O Govinda, the ancient and supreme Pundarikaksha, the sole guide for crossing the treacherous and shoreless ocean of samsara. Thou who art responsible for the four states of existence known as the manifest, the unmanifest, the knower, and time, Kala, and art named Vasudev, Lord of the Universe, Sankarshan, Master of the Universe, the most blessed Pradyumna, and the glorious Aniruddha, the Invincible, who art the aggregate of the diverse Vibhavas, who art the possessor of all the various aspects of divine greatness, who possesses a form that is divine, tranquil, active, and blissful, manifesting the sixfold attributes, who art adorned with a bright crown, armlets, necklaces, anklets, kaustuba, and the yellow garment. O thou great and generous one, with eyes like the lotus, thou four-bodied chaturvyuha, brilliant as the autumnal lotus, O thou exquisitely beautiful Lord Narayana, embracing the whole universe. These living beings are all drowning in the ocean of suffering. O Lord, by what device thinkest thou they can be saved? Thus addressed, the God of gods, the Lord, answered with a smile, O lotus seated, lotus born, lotus goddess, I have devised methods whereby these souls may be liberated. Such methods are performing the rites and following the principles of Sankhya and Yoga according to the sacred texts. So informed, I answered God, the excellent person, O God of gods, it is impossible for them to follow these methods in the course of fleeting time. Kala is the inciter. It is independent and its essence is bhavat, becoming. Kala severs their jnana, sattva, pure consciousness, physical energy, and also their span of life. Various vasana, impressions, stored in the inner organ under influence of a particular kala, torment the embodied beings. Although thou art unattached, yet thou ascribest the results of their deeds as affected by a particular kala to those who perform their functions and duties. O merciful Janardana, disclose to me who prostrate before thee the method that thou, in thy compassion, hast devised to rescue living beings. When I had so pleaded, the beloved Lord answered me with a smile, O Lotus Goddess, thou thyself art aware of the answer, and yet thou askest me. Nevertheless, O beautiful one, listen. I have laid down rules for both meritorious and evil deeds as prescribed by the religious texts. Worthy deeds are those prescribed by the religious texts, while other deeds are prohibited. He who pursues harmful activities is thereby spiritually degraded. He who follows the prescribed methods is uplifted. But he who renounces both the prescribed methods and the prohibited deeds and follows a middle course by relying solely on me for protection, ultimately becomes united with me. O lotus-born goddess, hear me describe the method with six components whereby this can be achieved. 1. The resolution to perform only such acts as conform to my desires. 2. The abandonment of all acts that displease me. 3. 
the firm conviction that I will protect him who chooses me as his sole protector. 5. Self-surrender and 6. Humility These are the six components of the middle course called Sharanagati. Having thus obtained my protection, the adept is freed from misfortunes such as fear, sorrow, and exhaustion, from all selfish activity and desire, from self-interest and pride, and sheltering in me alone, he is carried, as it were, across the ocean of worldly existence. The pure, who are intent upon confining themselves solely to the performance of meritorious pure deeds, and those who know Sankhya and Yoga, are in no sense comparable to even a billionth fraction of him who has unreservedly resorted to me for help. These words of the great god Vishnu gave me great satisfaction, and I repeat to you what he said. Chakra I salute thee, O great goddess, the beloved of God, who art seated on a lotus. Deign to explain to me in detail what conforming to God's desires, etc., entails. Shri, Anukulya entails being benevolently disposed towards all beings based on the conviction that I exist in all beings. One should always be favorably disposed towards all beings, just as one is toward me. Likewise, all forms of hostility towards living beings should be dropped. Repudiation of arrogance implies humility achieved through sacred knowledge and good conduct. Sometimes upaya, the prescribed method, cannot be performed owing to the impossibility of procuring all the requirements for performance of the supporting rites because of inability to officiate in the prescribed manner or perhaps for want of an auspicious opportunity to perform such rites on account of discrepancies in the place, time, or qualification. Whereas compared to what is prescribed, apaya, what is prohibited, is still more exacting. The repudiation of arrogance calls for dynyam, timidity, and karpanyam, humility. Since shakti is innate in God, who is ever merciful, and since there is a basic relationship between God as master and living beings as his subjects, the deep-rooted conviction arises in the mind of devotees that because God is benevolent, he will protect us. Such implicit trust, O Chakra, destroys all demerit. Although God is the master of all embodied beings, and although he is full of compassion and capable of showing it, yet without prayer he will not protect. This consideration is inducement to pray, using the words, Be my protector, which imply throwing oneself on his protection. The whole process of renunciation, which starts with those who rely solely on God's protection, waiving the right to claim the results of deeds performed by them, and ends with relinquishing that privilege in favor of Keshava, is called Atma Nikshepa, self-surrender, Nyasa, abandoning, resigning, and trusting or delivering which is synonymous with nikshepa, has five components. It is also referred to as sannyasa, tyaga, or sharanagati. This is the fourth method which was spoken of earlier. It achieves quick results. Those who follow this fourth method as practiced by the brahmanas tend to regard the three previous methods as less attractive.
It has been said that the practice of karpanya, relying on God's compassion, dispenses with the necessity of adhering to the upayas, methods. And yet, confidence in God's protection makes it desirable to adhere to the upaya. Begging the Lord for protection proclaims the adept's yearning for protection. The need for this arises from the consideration that, although the Lord of the universe is omniscient and ever compassionate, yet in order not to disturb the law and order of the world, he awaits being approached for protection. Dedication of oneself and all one's possessions is called Atma Nikshepa. The Shastra indicates that hingsa, violence, theft, etc., are apayas, and that both karman, religious duties, sankhya, etc., are upayas. He who rejects both upaya and apaya, and, convinced of God's protection, has recourse to the middle path by surrendering to God all that he possesses, will realize that Purushottama, the God of Gods, is his protector. Chakra O Ambika, what is this middle course between Upaya and Apaya? Since all action springs from either Upaya or Apaya accordingly, as the prohibitions and injunctions laid down in the Shastras are obeyed or disregarded, it would appear that every activity necessarily falls either under one or the other. Shri O King of Gods, there are three inscrutable types of karma, deeds. Learn to distinguish between them by applying the prohibitions and regulations laid down in the Shastras. Some deeds produce harmful results, whilst others produce beneficial results. Others, again, redeem sins. In the light of the Shastras, recognize these three types of deeds. The first two types, known as Upaya and Upaya, should be rejected. The third group, that redeems sin again has two subdivisions. The first consists of prayashchita, which annihilate the evil consequences of misdeeds. The intelligent should avoid deeds of that nature, just as in the case of the first two groups. Only those duties which, when performed, bring no reward, but when ignored, result in harm, should be performed by the adept. This is the attitude taken by the Vedas, which endorse the middle way between Upaya and Apaya. He who follows this road seeks refuge in Prapadyate, surrendering himself wholeheartedly to the Lord of the Universe, Janardana. The method prescribed by the Satvata scriptures if practiced even once, will liberate the human being. Whereas by following upaya and apaya, he is bereft of that benefit. If one intentionally performs some apaya deed, a redeeming rite should be performed without delay. But he who has sought refuge in sharanagati discovers that act in itself to be as efficacious as Prayaschita. Again, even if the Upayas are accepted as such, the position remains unchanged. In order not to dislocate the laws of Dharma and to maintain the family, to govern the world without disturbance, to establish social norms, and to gratify me and Vishnu, the god of gods, Sharngin, the wise should not violate the Vedic laws, even in thought. Just as even a king's favorite who defiles a river that is useful to that monarch, a source of pleasure and beneficial to the community for raising crops, incurs the death penalty 
even though he be indifferent to the river, so also does a mortal who disregards the norm laid down in the Vedas and thereby disobeys my command forfeit my favor, though he be a favorite of mine. Thus, mentally giving up attachment to the upayas, the wise adopt the fourth method, sharanagati, and having overcome all kleshas, afflictions, enter padam, the pure state of sattva existence. Hence, the middle path that is neither upaya nor upaya is called sharanagati. It is the foremost means of attaining the summum bonum, enabling human beings to traverse the ocean of life and death. It is the only way of refuge whereby both the learned and the ignorant may set foot on that longed-for further shore of the ocean of mundane existence and become eternal. The redemption of sinful acts through sharanagati must be sought through me alone, consort of the God of gods. Abstaining from upaya, let the human beings take refuge in me. Thus, gradually nearer to me, shakti, and intent on observing upaya, after harvesting the results of his immaculate deeds, he finally becomes detached from all worldly ties and acquires the highest status. This sharanagati, or complete self-surrender, is a means of attaining the human goal. Simple to follow, but, in my opinion, difficult to carry out. Therefore, only the cultured and the wise who have rid their minds of all desire, choose this path of sharanagati. Hence, to achieve their aim, whether rid of desire or not, men should always worship my mantra form. In accordance with the ritual precepts, the adept should receive initiation from a preceptor, attain the fulfillment of his aspirations, and worship my mantra form with mantras consisting of me.